If you two are going to be running experiments with colony equipment, you two need to submit a full description of the project. There doesn't seem to be any paperwork file for project 43778 underscore dogs underscore 44. The whistles and clicks of Krukik's voice was unmistakable as the short, stocky sentient stepped through the door of the lab. Mateo and Jessica both froze, their shoulders hunched upwards, and they looked at one another in locked eyes. The jig, as the old Earth expression went, was up. Uh, Mateo began uncertainly. What are you working on here? Krukik queried. At less than a meter in height, the diminutive sapient couldn't actually see the top of the workstation where their human counterparts were busily decanting something for one of the amnonic maturation chambers. Krukit began tapping at the screen of the tablet for emphasis while speaking. There's no write-up, no genetic profile, no species specifications, I don't even see the director's authorization. Krukit's throat sack inflated slightly, a deep burgundy of alarm. You didn't get Dr. Brugglethorpe's authorization? What is going on? The Lokiri geneticist stumbled badly through the pronunciation of the unusual human name, but Matteo and Jessica both knew Krukik was referring to Dr. Burglethorpe, head of the Colony Genetics Laboratory. It's something we thought might help improve the safety of survey teams when they went to the mainland, Jessica started. It actually isn't an experiment. We were going through the catalogue of species and genetic samples that came down with the colony ship, and, well, we found this one. We, um, we kind of got ahead of ourselves and didn't exactly ask permission. She trailed off as tiny noises started to emanate from the top of the workbench. Squeaks, whines and whimpers quickly began to fill the air. Jessica and Matteo shook themselves out of the shock of being caught with their hands in the proverbial cookie jar and began going through the decanting checklist. They began reporting body temperatures, birth masses and other statistics to their audio recorders. What species is it? Krukik walked up to the work table and rose up as high as they could on their feet. Krukik's eyes came just over the edge of the table just enough to see what was happening. A half a dozen tiny little lumps of wet fur were laying on the workbench. Matteo and Jessica kept interrupting their verbal reporting and examination of the tiny wriggling creatures to make cooing noises as they cleaned away the amniotic fluid and cloned placental tissues of the maturation chamber. Krukik's eyes narrowed in suspicion. The creatures were small and helpless, but their facial features were obvious, even at this early stage of development. Prominent rhinarium tissue around what appeared to be nasal passages, binocular vision. What is the catalogue number for this species? Krukik demanded while looking up at Matteo. The human male towered over Krukik, the better part of two metres in height, glanced down at him while wiping one of the tiny creatures clean and used his headlamp to examine it. It's, um... Matteo stumbled through the words as he tried to examine the tiny, squirming creature. He sighed heavily, knowing that the truth had to come out at some point. It's an old Geneco line, originally designed as a working animal for human colonists. Catalogue number 735-4552-6389. They've been around for a century. This was the latest version when the company sent us out here to settle. They are perfectly safe. Matteo added the last part in a hurry. Krukik was familiar with many of the activities that humans considered safe, and stepped back from the table. Bringing up the tablet, Krukik flipped through the menus until they came to the catalogue for the original biological specimen inventory sent out with the colony. Crooked punched in the catalogue number and read through the data, eyes opening wider at every line. Typical mass for males, nearly 70 kilos, height of the shoulder, 75 to 85 centimetres. Crooked's heart beat faster reading through every line, skin warming as blood rushed into the muscles, part of an instinctive fight or flight response that still held sway even thousands of years after evolving away from the dark forested swamps where the Lokiri came to sentience. The list continued. Binocular vision, enlarged olfactory and auditory processing centers in the brain. In the name of the Holy Brood Mothers, what are these things? Krukit couldn't help but use the ancient religious invocation as pictures of full-grown adults scroll past. The list went on. Quadrupedal, top sprint speed of 40 meters per second, by force of of 4.82 times 10 to the power of 6 Pascal? Krukik dropped the tablet, mind swirling. Krukik, clawed hand shaking, pointed at the humans while backing away. You've... you've killed us all! This... this is a monster! An abominable horror! No one will survive! The clicks and whistles were pitched uncomfortably high and almost painfully loud in the decanting room. 
Crookick, Crookick, just relax. The last time you got like this, you passed out. Deep breaths, little buddy. Jessica set the tiny, squeeny ball of fur down on the table and turned to face the Lockyeri scientist. She held her hands out in a placating manner, suddenly walking towards Crookick. Even though the human female had never threatened Crookick, her emerald green eyes were still startling. Binocular vision, the eyes of a predator. No. No. I have to. I... Crookick began gasping for breaths, leaned against the wall. Blackness closed in around his vision. The little scientist was in the middle of a panic attack. I have to tell the others, he trailed off. Jessica got down on her knees and helped as Crookick slumped to the floor, trying to work through the panic attack. Why? Why would you resurrect such a monster? Crookick looked up into the eyes of the human female in front of him. She stroked his scale, trying to calm him, help him. He knew that Jessica and Matteo were both good, or at least he thought they were. He had seen them show kindness and mercy, generosity and selflessness. How could they breed a monster? A carnival horror the likes of which Crookick had only read about in school. Crookick did not know. Jessica's face reddened. An atomic reaction that Crookick knew frequently accompanied feelings of guilt or embarrassment. Crookick had heard the humans refer to it as blushing. Well, we... I... She stumbled over her words. I've always wanted a dog, and bigger dogs are always great snugglers. Jessica gave Crookick a large, toothy smile. Among humans, it was meant as an expression of happiness, but the array of white teeth still sent little pangs of panic through Crookick's body. And the gene line that these guys came from are based on mastiffs. Matteo held one of the squirming death machines up to his face, culling it as he cried. My parents used to breed mastiffs. They make great babysitters. Matteo then kissed the primal horror in his hands and set it on the table. Babysitters? Crookick squealed loudly before passing out.